what would you do? An angel shows up, gives you an order, says at noon, I want you to take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's it. There's no other, like, brief. There's no explanation. There's no mission parameters. Just go. You don't know what you're going to, but just go. Would you go? Well, Philip goes. And while he's on the road, he notices a carriage, and then the Spirit tells Philip, catch up with him. And so Philip starts running. Can you see this in your head? I'm, I'm picturing someone running to catch a bus or um, a train, you know, running along the platform and reaching out to grab the handle and jumping on the step at the last second. It's kind of a, a strange scene. And it makes me wonder how often someone ran alongside a carriage and started talking to the people inside. I'm guessing not often. Because there must have been a class difference here. The Ethiopian was in a carriage and Philip was not. Not everyone traveled by carriage. Uh, a person would have to be uh, a person of a certain means uh, in order to afford a carriage. And so I, I guess that would, um, I would guess that a person in a carriage might not want to talk to a person who's running alongside uh, the carriage. A person doing that would, uh, I don't know, be asking for money. Uh, they might want to do harm to you. Uh, people just don't run beside cars, right? So this is what I was thinking as I ran alongside the Jeep at the bank. I was trying really hard to get her attention. I was waving my hands, I was yelling, and she was trying really hard to ignore me. And she's already befuddled, right? Her car isn't working right, and she's wondered, worried about that, I'm sure. And she's just been to the ATM, and of course it's never a good idea to talk to a stranger right after you've been to the ATM, right? And here I am, I'm trying to flag her down, I'm, I'm running like a wild man, and uh, she's wondering, why am I running after her? Well, the Spirit is telling me to. So finally she stops, and I get her to roll down her passenger window just an inch, and I say, your parking brake is on. And she says, how do I turn it off? And I said, I don't know, is there a, a third pedal on the left over there? And she looks down in the wheel, well, no, there's no pedal. Okay, is there a lever between your seats? <coughs> no, no lever. And she just goes, here, you look. She gets out of her car, leaves her passenger or driver door open, gets out. Uh, what is happening? Why don't you, you see if you can figure it out? And so this woman has just let me into the driver's seat of her car. Her purse is on the passenger seat. The car's running. She's trusted me with lots of valuable things of hers, right? Right after I ran after her. So I looked down at the floor, there's no third pedal. I looked at the center console, there's no brake lever. But there is a big button with a P on it. And so I reach down and I lift up that, that button and um, it shuts off. And I get out of the car and I show her where the button is and she thanks me and she drives away. And then as I walk back to the car, which is still at the ATM running with my driver's door open. <laughs> <laughs> I hear, that was nice of you to help her. <laughs> <laughs> the bank teller had watched the whole thing. <laughs> there was a level of risk that had to be taken in this situation, because I left my vehicle. And um, I'm acting aggressively toward a stranger who is already nervous. And I don't know if she has a weapon ready, I don't know if she's calling the police. There was some risk here. And there was some trust that had to be given by her. I mean, she had to risk stopping for this stranger. She had to risk lowering her window. She had to risk uh, to receive the help that she needed. And this is all happening in the encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian. Philip asks, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian, a stranger in a strange land, you know, he's a, he's a man of education and intelligence. He'd have to be to be in charge of the Queen's accounts. But he's 
also a servant. And he, and he can't really admit that um, he's ignorant of this and keep his job. I mean, he can't admit ignorance in any term and keep his job. But he does that here. He takes a risk and he tells Philip that he needs some help on this spiritual journey. <coughs> because of this, Philip gets to lay out the gospel. Would you do that? A chance encounter in the park. You overhear a conversation about church. Now these are young mothers maybe who are talking about whether they should take their young kids to church like their parents did. You know, is it really that important? Is it, is it worthwhile? Does it cost anything? And which church? Because there are so many. And God keeps urging you to talk to them. Do you? Do you approach? Do you admit that you overheard the conversation? You've already decided to politely keep to yourself, but God won't shut up, right? God keeps telling you, go over there. You hear one ask if they know anyone. Do you know anyone that goes to church? Seriously, they're seeking information, and you have it. No, I don't think. I don't, I don't know that much about church. I can't answer their questions about the Bible. I, I'm not the right person to talk to them. If only, insert the name of the person you think knows all about the Bible, here. If only they were here. But you are the right person, and you do know enough. And if you don't have all the answers, you know people who can help with them. You are the right person. That's why God put you there. So what do you do? Will you be so bold? To answer when God calls upon you to share your faith with someone who needs to hear it. Will you be so bold to risk looking ignorant about the Bible in order to begin a relationship of love and a journey with someone else? Will you be so bold to chase after a carriage or a car? Or a conversation in the park. Okay, so I, I get that this seems a bit premature. Like, what if we knew what we should say? What if we knew the important stuff enough to be able to talk about it with a stranger? I, I hear you. And so over the course of the next year, we're going to work on this. We're going to um, talk about what is really important in our faith walk. What are the essential elements to being a disciple. What, what are the must-do? We're going to address these questions together. And after we talk about the essentials, we're going to see if we're doing those things. And if not, then we're going to start doing them. We'll, we'll lay them all out in a pathway, a road. We'll make a road map that shows us how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And along the way, we're going to practice these things. We'll develop this discipleship pathway, and we'll do a self-assessment about our own discipleship. What will we need to do in order to deepen our own discipleship, our own walk? That's important. But it's equally important for us to be able to tell others what it means to be a disciple if they ask. It's a complex thing to do, but let's see if we can make it simple to learn. God is calling us to this road. God is calling us to trust that if we get on this road, that we will have an encounter that will change someone's life. Will you go boldly with me? Let's pray. Now talking about our faith, sometimes it's scary. Because we're not sure if we're doing what we need to be doing. So God, we, uh, we commit today to, to learning and to discovering, to exploring, and to going deeper in our faith so that we might be ready when you call upon us to talk about it. Help us to be open to the prompting of your spirit and to the leading wherever you send us. <coughs> In your name we pray.